Stay more comfortable, more concealed, and in the stand longer with Osseo gear. Premium camouflage apparel created for bow hunters by bow hunters. Osseo's revolutionary patented camo patterns and innovative features are designed to keep whitetail bow hunters totally invisible and dead quiet. Elevate your game with Osseo. Visit asiogear.com and take 20% off your purchase with code TRUTH20. Mobile hunters, our buddies over at Tethered are always innovating to keep us more mobile and in the game when it counts. From the Tethered One Sticks, the Fast Pack, to the Ultra Lock Saddle, Tethered is always designing to increase comfort and utility while reducing bulk, weight, and fiddle factor of mobile hunting gear. And now, they've outdone themselves yet again by creating the Carbon Fiber Forged Predator CFX Platform, the lightest fully featured mobile saddle platform that raises the bar for what's possible in mobile hunting gear. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old tree climbing veteran, go to tetherednation.com for all your saddle hunting gear. Welcome to the Truth From Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 379. Today, I'm joined by my buddy, Luke Scheimer, to talk about an outdoor life from the West to the Caribbean. So stay tuned. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you're doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. Hopefully you've dried out. If you've been sitting in the soggy rain like me, watching out the window, wishing you could go scout the place you've been waiting months to go scout because it seems every every weekend there's, there was either a snowstorm, a bunch of rain, a funeral, you know, whatever the case might be that you've not been able to get out. But I'm looking out the window right now, even though I didn't get to the North Peace it's an awesome bluebird day. All the weather is pushed out. So I'm going to take full advantage of it and uh, head out and do a little bit of scouting, some shed hunting and pull. I think the last camera that I have locally that I haven't checked, pull that, um, take the dog out and do that for a couple of hours uh, here this afternoon, especially since we got an extra, an extra hour of daylight. You know, so I'm going to try to spend that, um, spend that wisely. I doubt I will stumble across any sheds, but you know, crazier things, um, because your things have happened. The the camera check, I did the same thing last weekend and actually had a couple good deer in the local area um, that I'd be happy to kill and starting to learn a little bit more about this one general area. It's not a new piece necessarily. It's a new area that I've kind of jumped into last year, set a camera, let it just kind of work for the year. And uh, it's given me, it's not just giving me puzzle pieces about that spot, but there's some terrain and stuff that kind of connects it to some um some other areas that I've hunted before. And so it's given me, I guess maybe just a broader picture of how the deer are kind of using that general area and how they're moving. And, um, what I really kind of learned is this area in the past, I've probably hunted it a little bit wrong. Cause I've, I was always really patient with it. Um, thinking that, you know, don't want to get in there too, too early or too, too much before prime time. Um, or at least, you know, before that mid October kind of time frame at least for me, cause that's the time frame I really like. Uh, but what I really kind of learned is that man, this spot, because my season opens early, you know, uh, mid September, this spot is really in this general area is really a early season, you know, late September, very early part of October. And there's a lot of daylight movement. Um, and so I just kind of put that in my back pocket to know, uh, to be able to use, you know, going into the, uh, into this upcoming fall and, you know, and, and going forward. Cause I, I was always kind of hunting it slightly wrong. I was always kind of like a day late and a dollar short. It felt like on any of the deer that I was trying to chase in that particular, in that particular area. But with that, we're going to go ahead and just jump into today's show. Have my buddy Luke Scheimer on, uh, my buddy Luke, he's actually a hometown guy. Um, we grew up in the same town. Uh, I actually, I, I knew of him cause he's a little bit younger than me and, but he was good friends with my, with my cousin, buddy. And uh, the way I kind of met Luke is I went on a hunt with uh, my my cousin Buddy and his friend Matt. And uh, Luke at that time had moved from our hometown, went to college in Montana, had graduated, had been living out there. And so we, you know, they would always venture out to hunt elk with him and mule deer. And so I went along the one year, and that's kind of how I met um, met Luke. And we just kind of hit it off, and we stayed stayed friends, and we stayed we've stayed connected since. And we you know text each other pretty frequently, and we both love wrestling, we both do jujitsu, and so there's a lot of those things. Um, in common, but the thing about Luke that I've always kind of, you know, um, 
you know, when I, when I was thinking about him and just in how he hunts and stuff like that, what I always kind of admired about him is that he's just, he's a super sharp woodsman. Uh, his mental toughness is just second is second to none. And he's just about as genuine and authentic a person that you will, uh, that you will come across, which is even, you know, obviously more important than his skills in the woods, which are pretty, which are pretty significant. But he's one of those guys, man, that, you know, that I always kind of, you know, watch and, um, and, and, and I'm super stoked for that is, you know, is building the life that he wants. You know, that's, uh, I always am, am super pumped whenever I know when I have friends who are building the, the, the type of life that they want. And that's kind of what he's done. Everything from living West, you know, being able to come back to PA and then, you know, he's now, you know, living part of the year in the Caribbean, um, and doing some really cool stuff down there too. And it's just, it's really cool to see your buddies do, do well. And, um, and, and build a, an awesome outdoor life for themselves. And that's exactly what he has done. And that's what we talked about today. So with that, we're going to go, go ahead and jump into today's show. As always, thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From Stan Deer Hunting Podcast. And today I have on my buddy, you guys have heard of him on the podcast a couple of times, probably actually since like 2017, but he is none other than Mr. Luke Scheimer, hailing from the great state of Pennsylvania, the real BC by way of Montana, vis-a-vis the U.S. Virgin Islands. What's going on, man? Hey, Clint. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. You bet, man. It's been a long time coming, dude. We have uh, we were kind of joking before we were uh, getting all set up here that uh, this, this podcast has been kind of seven years in the making, if you will, <laughs> right? Yeah, 2017 to 2024. You're looking at at least six and a half years for sure. Right. Yeah. And it's a uh, it, man. It, has it been that long? I was looking back through some old photos of uh, actually that hunt that when I came out to Montana, it's hard to believe, man, it's been that long since I've been out there. Yeah, that was September of mid to late September 2017. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that was a good hunt, man. I still uh, I still kind of I, I still tell the story. So uh, do you know what? Well, let me ask. I'll ask you the question. What do you think my most memorable part of that trip was? Oof. I mean, that's a lot to unpack right there in itself. Right. We did a in, but what'd we do? Yeah. Over 70 miles hiked in like six or seven days, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. It was So um, my, 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 my favorite memory of that trip and what I always tell people when I tell a story about it is the, um, the day that it snowed and we had to kind of take the day off because it was just, it was just pounding down. And then the next day we got out and we did that, that loop. I forget what, I forget what that, I, will, I wouldn't mention the area anyway, but it was kind of like an old logging trail or a trail that kind of wrapped around the mountain. And then we went up on top of the mountain and watched a herd of, uh, uh, mule deer on the, on the mountain that was adjacent. And that snow was like thought or, uh, was like shin high. And we ended up doing 15 miles total that day. And I remember we got to top like the crest of this mountain when we could see the other side that we were glassing and we all kind of like ate lunch, laid down in the snow and took a nap. And I remember laying in that snow thinking, eh, this is how people die out here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Cause it was, a, it was a wet, rainy snow and just miserable. I remember, remember one of the guys said, a trash bag on yeah. potentially feet for a creek crossing or something like that. <laughs> uh, you, did, we were, you did we were committed deep that day was five miles at least one way and then the, whatever we hunted inside of that yeah yeah and you knew the guy that was wearing that trash bag was buddy it, for sure yeah because you know that <laughs> oh, fool yeah. wasn't spending any money on rain gear that's right <laughs> oh man yeah, that was a great time, man. I'm so I'm 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 gathering points, man. So I'm hoping here in the next couple of years. I, I think I was actually talking to my buddy. Um, I think it'll be 26 is when I'll plan to come back out. So I'll keep you abreast as to what my plans are, what unit. Because I was telling my buddy Chad, who I'll be you know hunting with. I was like, you know, when we draw Montana, I was like, we got to let my buddy Luke know. I was like, because uh, you'll enjoy hunting with him. He's just like you, dude. He, he likes to get after it. You know, there's no mountain too high and there's not enough miles to, to wear him out. So, you know, you, you two are birds of a feather. I love that. I'd be offended if I didn't hear from you when you drew a tag. So, looking right. forward. 
Nice. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that, man. You are, you're on speed dial when that Montana, when that Montana trip comes. But so dude, it's been, so it's been on, you've not been on the show ever and it's, you know, pretty much I'm fully to blame for that. You should have been on a, lo- a long time ago. People have heard your name, you know, on the show that I've kind of dropped at different times talking about hunts and, you know, a guy that I kind of, you know, I put on, a, a, I have in high regard as far as like a, a, a hunter and, and more so just like a general outdoorsman, you know, is kind of, you know, and when I think about you and all the things that you do as far as hunting and fishing, it's just like, there's not, there's not any one thing I, I can think of that in the outdoors that you're not kind of equipped to handle. But before we jump into all that, if you wouldn't mind, just give the folks, you know, at home listening, maybe even some folks listening in, uh, in old BC, um, you know, what you've been up to, what you do for a profession, you know, what you do for a living and so forth. Right. Uh, great question. So when you met me in uh, 2017, I was waist deep in a career with the U.S. Forest Service in Montana. Started with that agency in 2008. And at that time, and still up until the time that I resigned, I was in a range man, rangeland management program, which a short and condensed version was, I oversaw a livestock program for the federal agency, served as the guy between privately owned cattle, you know, ranchers, mm-hmm. and the government. So the, the privately owned livestock were per- permitted to graze on federal public land. And with that, um, I kind of got my feet wet in it as being the boots on the ground guy, you know, go out on foot, horseback, four wheeler, uh, just in the mountains, Mm -hmm. taking notes, taking photos, jotting all that down, bringing it back to my supervisor. And then by the time I resigned, I was kind of at that position, pseudo overseeing a grazing program. Um, Not as big a scale as when you were there, Mm -hmm. but it was still predominantly cattle, some sheep, but mainly all cattle. Hmm. And since then, I resigned in 2021, and I have shifted my life to the Virgin Islands, where I'm now a uh, merchant mariner. So I'm a charter boat captain on the water down here. Hmm. Um, Dabbled in a little bit of fishing with that. Wasn't my forte. Shifted more so to pleasure boat charters, primarily taking people from the U.S. Virgin Islands over to the British Virgin Islands on day trips right now. So anything from snorkeling adventures, crawling around beach bars, different random beaches throughout scattered islands up through the U.S. and British Virgin Islands, and just everything that this place has to offer, we, we can pack it into one day and, and and strive to do that to make it a once in a lifetime memory on the water. Nice, man. That's awesome. And I, it's, uh, it's the best of both worlds, man. Like, you know, I, I, I live vicariously through you a little bit, <laughs> especially, uh, you know, whenever we got the, uh, the, uh, the March kind of blast foot of snow that I know is coming here in like the next week or so in Pennsylvania, you always kind of get that one last kiss from, uh, from, uh, from winter. And, uh, I'm watching you on Instagram, you know, out, doing some fishing you were flat water fishing the other day with a fly pole i saw like a couple weeks ago and uh yeah man that's a it's a how did how did you kind of make the shift like of let me ask this how much of a shock was it kind of moving or going from you know living in montana you know year-round full-time you know because you went to school out there like you moved out there and went to college and and worked for for a long time to now kind of splitting your time between there and in the Virgin Islands. Like how much of a culture shock is that? Big. Yeah. To, to make it's big. Um, being raised in, you know, South Central, Southwestern Pennsylvania, I knew from an early age that I always wanted to go West. Like mm-hmm. I had this beating drum in my chest that, that I was to, to be somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I didn't know where that was. My parents helped me kind of figure out where that space would be. And when I made it to Montana, specifically in the town that you met me in down in kind of Southwestern Montana, that drum for me quit beating. And I knew that's where my peace was to be found Mm -hmm. from that moment forward. I was like, I'm going to die in this place. Like this is meant for me. I'm I'm not where else like this is, this is me. And then as time ticked on, I had the opportunity 
with working through the agency to step away for a couple months in the winter. Mm-hmm. So I designed, designed my life. I went from full-time year-round employee to a full-time seasonal employee, which would give me roughly four months off every winter by my personal choice. Mm-hmm. So with that, I would seek warmer locations. Like it, I, even though I was in the West chasing this passion that I had and I loved it, there was still a big part of me that wanted to explore the sea. Mm-hmm. I do remember talking to my dad, like, I got to figure a way to get to the Bahamas. I want to get down into the Exumas. I knew what I wanted to do. I just couldn't figure out how to do it. Mm-hmm. So in 2017, the year you came out, ironically, uh, Hurricane Irma came through the U.S. Virgin Islands along with Puerto Rico and the British Islands and completely devastated this place. I would say it's it's not even arguably it is the most devastating hurricane on record down through this area. So with that, a friend of mine with the Forest Service came down here to provide some hurricane relief. He came back from that spring. Him and I talked. That year I was in Florida, Cuba, kicking around. And we met in the spring and he said, hey, I think we have an opportunity down there to do some commercial diving for, for lobster, conch, and can also do some spear fishing." At that time, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I said, let's go. <laughs> Dude, not, I, like, I can just imagine it's like, hey, we could do some of this really cool stuff. And you're like, uh, my bag's packed, bro. <laughs> right. So that's what found me this place. Prior to that, prior to that storm, I had never even really knew what the U.S. Virgin Islands were. I just, I knew where Puerto Rico was. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about the Virgin Islands. Yeah, it's whenever I started because I didn't, you know, we would chat, you know, text message and stuff like that, you know, over over the years and so forth. And I'd always see, you know, pictures popping up like, you know, you in the the Caribbean and stuff like that. And um, I really I wasn't sure like how you landed there, but I but I wasn't surprised to be honest, right? Because you just you like adventure, right? And I and I knew that about you, and so it was like, man, eh, you know, Luke's out adventuring, doing his thing, and it's not surprising also that you would find yourself like wanting to kind of get toward the water. Cause your dad's a big hunter, but he's also, he might be a even bigger fisherman than he is a, than he is a hunter. If I'm not mistaken. Right. I would agree with that. Yeah. It is older. Yeah. So, you know, so now you kind of split your time between the two, right? Like that, is that kind of really what, you know, you spend, you know, the hunting season, like the fall, late summer, fall into, you know, winter, if you will, you know, early winter. And then you kind of, and then you kind of book it back to the, back to the Caribbean. Yeah. So right now I'm kind of kicking out of the Virgin Islands in August and don't return here till Thanksgiving, late November, somewhere in there. Right. And, and so whenever you get back, it, when you get back, longer, sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. Even a little longer than that for sure. Yeah. So when you get back to Montana, are you, uh, is it just like full, full on go time, hunt, hunt, uh, time to hunt and get after it? You know, right before I made the jump to come down here full time in 21, I, I bought a home, mm-hmm. in, um, September of 20. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to do a couple short little remodels on this, get this place buttoned up and then have a, a really good home base to come back here. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's turned into Ceilings, floors, <laughs> placing walls and remodeling kitchen, remodeling bathrooms. So I, I have a couple more months of work on that place. So when I get back there, I'm torn between, hey, you know, let's let's get in the mountains. Also, at the same time, I need to get these projects done. Right. But for the most part, right, I'm losing sleep starting in early, early summer thinking about getting back to the lifestyle Montana has to offer. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, man, because... Montana is one of those places that if you've never been, you know, I remember in you know, that trip uh, that I made, I remember the whole drive home. And even after that, all I could think about was how do I, how do I can continue to, to make my way West? You know, how do I spend more time there? Um, and, uh, and I'm just, I'm stoked whenever I, when I have friends like, like you that, you know, make those things a reality that kind of build, build a purpose built life you know, around, around that. But, you know, I mean, you said, you know, at the beginning that there was this thing that was kind of drawing you to, to the West, right. Even like when you're, when you were young. And so I'm just curious was, was the experience of the hunting in the outdoors when you were young, you know, and, and, you know, was that kind of what drew you to it or was it, was it something beyond that? (sighs) 
you know, hunting for me, I don't, I don't want to sound uh, horny in saying this, but in all honestly, I feel that it was genetically ingrained, mm. not, not just culturally from where, where I come from, but from when I was at, my earliest memories were, you know, catching lizards, mm-hmm. hunting things around the house. And I can remember, Clint, I was four, maybe five years old. And we were living in South Florida. My dad had moved us from Pennsylvania to down there for just a couple of years. And he had went on a two-week trip with an uncle of mine out to Cody, Wyoming. And they were did a horse hunt up into the thoroughfare. Granted, I didn't know all this at the time. I just knew my dad was going to Wyoming. Right. And I, I can remember specifically, I had these three or four sticks that I had collected. And I was sharpening them in the concrete driveway. <laughs> So proud that when my dad came back, I, I remember walking right up to him. The first thing was like, "Dad, I made these sticks, and when we go back to Pennsylvania, I'm going to jump out of a tree and harvest the deer." <laughs> like I didn't say like that right, but that that was my intention. And I remember when we packed the U-Haul, packed the boat trailer, packed the trucks. I had those sticks with me. Dad might have thrown them out the window. We didn't even make it a block down the road, but <laughs> to me, it was a big deal. Yeah. And, um. As life went on, I just gravitated towards guys of like-minded thought. Mm-hmm. When I was young, like my my heroes and the guys that I looked up to, they weren't professional athletes. I didn't want to be a firefighter. I didn't want to be a policeman. It was these guys that I would hear my dad and my uncles talk about that were like local legends. To me now, they might have been a little bit of outlaws. But at the time, like, they were the guys that were phenomenal turkey hunters that were on the cutting edge. Before turkey season was even developed in Pennsylvania, these guys were hunting spring turkeys and building calls, Mm. you know, out of household items for deer, for turkeys. And these guys were like my heroes. Like, these are the guys I heard about. And I I just want what I wanted. I wanted to be able to confidently grow up and hang my hat beside them. Right. Um, so were the so those guys were kind of like your earliest influences then, right? Like as far as like how you know, because there's this weird thing, and, and I wouldn't, I would agree with you as far as it being, uh, you just you'll appreciate this. I'm going to try to describe it in a in a in a way that people listening might kind of like maybe get it. But you go through life and you meet people at times, and you know, for me, let's say you know, whenever I was playing music a lot. Right. And I was doing that. I was pretty decent at it. Right. I had a good run and, you know, made a living at it for a little while and, and stuff like that. And, but you would come across these people once in a while where you would just, they were just, dis- they were just different, you know, like it would be a musician, like a, a guitar player or a singer or whomever it was. And I'd be like, man, that dude is just made to do this. Like he was put here to do this. That's just as simple, as simple as that. Right. Or you meet a guy like, you know, Kale Sanderson, Penn State, you know, coach, right? It's like that guy was no doubt put on this earth to be a wrestler and a wrestling coach, right? Like that is just like his his purpose. And and it's funny because like I didn't know you before. I mean, I knew who you were, you know, because we grew up in a small town, you know, before coming out to Montana to, you know, to hunt and stuff like that. And um, and when I left, you know, it it was one of those things where, I had no doubt that you were put on this earth with like, that was, that was your thing. Like that was ingrained in you. Like hunting was your thing. Like I always kind of, I'd always kind of joke and, and say, did you ever see the movie? Um, the river runs through. Yeah. yeah. Trust me, I've seen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like that was like how, I, like you reminded me of that. Cause I was like, when you see someone who is so naturally in their element, that that's what they were born to do, that it just is, it's unmistakable. That was kind of how, when we were running the mountains together and stuff like that, that was kind of, you know, even though we're, we're peers, we're the same age and stuff like that. But I was watching you going like, that's, that's an outdoorsman. And that's kind of like what I hold like outdoorsman's kind of standards to is, is you know what I saw you do in, in the mountains and how you were able to navigate the mountains and, and just like how at home you are in those spaces. So I think you hit the nail on the head, man, whenever you say it's just kind of born into you. Cause I would, I a hundred percent agree just by, just by observing. Yeah, that's uh, that's very humbling to hear that from you, Clint. Um, but, but to put it in context, like my dad 
side of the family, he has two brothers. That whole side of my family was, was hunters. Like my uncles and then the great uncles that they talked about and the guys that they ran with, they grew up like, say they would have been in their twenties and thirties coming up through the the sixties through the eighties, somewhere in there. Right. Like these guys, these guys back then designed their life around hunting. Mm -hmm. Like they worked seasonal jobs, whether it was a painter, a carpenter, they poured concrete. They intentionally designed their life like that so that they would have hunting season off, whether it was running beagle hounds, coon hounds, turkey season, deer season, like they were, they sustained their lifestyle and their family on what they brought home from the mountains. Yeah. And I was just raised around that. Yeah. By the time I hit late high school and I had already been driving for a couple of years, I felt like there just wasn't enough space for me back there in mm-hmm. Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I just knew I had to go west. I, I, I don't, couldn't tell you a more better answer than that. Right. What, uh, do you think, you know, I, I think what's kind of really interesting about that time, um, when we think about, you know, the old timers, I guess, if you will, is that it was possible then to sustain yourself with that, that way of life, right? Not just from a hobby standpoint, right? But you could, you could legitimately kind of sustain yourself as a, as a person who is well-versed in the outdoors and, um, and things of that nature. Right. Do you think it's, do you think people could do that today still? Or do you think that that's like a, an art form and a lifestyle that is either lost entirely or almost completely lost at this point? It's like the question of the white picket fence dream for the American, right? Right. Same concept goes, can a, can a guy buy a tract of land right now, Clinton farm that and sustain his family on it right. or the, the taxes and just the operating expenses bury him. Right. Yeah. Look, you reflect back on those times of say even the seventies and look at what the fur prices were comparatively to what the fur prices are now, you know, it was a real deal to get 50 to $70 for prime box hides. You know, I don't know what Beaver was bringing at the time, but those guys all ran, they, they were houndsmen. They ran foxes in the mountains, the guys that I know. Mm-hmm. And you're talking, you go out there, kill a fox or two a week, three fox a week. Mm-hmm. It's 70 bucks a pop. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know anything right now that, that you can do that. Could you, could you go there and, sustain your family on legal harvest limits with inside of a state, maybe in places like Maryland where you can kill, kill a lot of deer. Right. But I, those times are slipping away. There's still guys in the Northwest territories of Alaska and the Yukon that can run big trap lines, Clint, and do it well. Right. Yeah. It's a, yeah, I guess that would probably be one of the few places you could still do it just because of the accessibility, right? Like, cause I think a lot of times when people think about that, you know, whether or not it's possible, I think the, I think the analogy or the juxtaposition you gave with, you know, that trapping hunting, you know, lifestyle for a living versus farming was, was, was a great one, right? Cause it's harder and harder for, for those folks to make ends meet and meet and survive. But and I guess Alaska would be the last place really that you could kind of sustainably do that. And I didn't even think about the idea of season limits and things of that nature, kind of like within a state, right? So it's, it would be exponentially harder if you lived say in the middle of a state where you didn't have access to another state to kind of play both sides, right? If that was something that you really were going to go after or really try to do, right? Cause you would kind of need to have the availability, availability of critters or an access and accessibility of critters, you know, expanded just because of the limitations that you have with, you know, bag limits and, and so forth, I would guess. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hands down. Yeah. Yeah. So when, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you, you mentioned Alaska, man, what's, uh, I'd be, I'd be lying if I, if I said, I didn't think that you had like an Alaska plan somewhere, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like, I'm curious, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. Do you have an Alaska plan? Like, you know, I can't imagine that's not a place you ha- that you haven't thought about spending an extended period of time in. Oh my God. Lose sleep over that. Clint, 
they a big part of me in my younger years avoided Alaska because I felt that once I went there, you'd never come back. Right. Yeah. And you know what? Still, within this past two years that I read a quote, um, it'll come to me who said it, but it was something along the lines of, "For once you go to Alaska, no other place compares." Mm-hmm. And for a young man of, of my mentality, that was dangerous. So now I feel like, yeah, that is definitely in the books for me. My, my wife and I, um, we went up there this year in September. We were there for over two weeks, did a did a moose hunt, fly-in moose hunt, really primitive experience. And it was phenomenal. And it, it lit a fire inside of us to where we say, man, if we can figure out a way to do that every year, we're going to sure strive to do it. Right. Would you ever... Uh... Would you ever try to make that your home? Oh. <laughs> I'm throwing out I'm throwing out some bombs, dude. <laughs> um and year round in Alaska? Well, maybe not year round. Maybe maybe kind of like what you got, you know, kind of how you operate now, right? Where it's like 50% Alaska, oh, yeah. you know, 50% in the islands, you know, situation. If I could, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's definitely not off the books. My, my wife and I have talked about that. Obviously, I'm married now, so the the selfish decisions of being just an independent guy, yeah, 20s and 30s is not there anymore, so there's there's more to take in. But if we were to have a, a podcast again in 10 years and I was an Alaska resident, I, there's a good possibility of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it, dude. I'd become sure. I'd become it to visit for sure. Oh, always welcome at my fire. I told you that before. That's right. That's right. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop giving you the hard life questions of you know <laughs> where are you gonna live the next twenty years and and stuff like that and, and trying to get you to move you know to the uh, to the Yukon or something and we'll start talking a little bit more hunting season. So how so you mentioned the moose hunt you guys did last year. Uh, how was your twenty three season just in in general? What all did you get into? Ooh. 2023 was a huge year for me. Um, did that big jujitsu tournament in Orlando, the the uh, IBJJF fans tournament. Uh, I won that. Then I got married in May. And the Lord blessed me with the most amazing woman. That's awesome. it, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe that. But to put it into perspective... Our honeymoon was a fly in moose hunt in Alaska. Dude, like when I saw that, I was like, I was like, man, that is the perfect, that is the perfect mate for, for Shimer. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a great time up there, Clint. So, so much gear is involved in that lifestyle. You yeah. saw, you saw the inventory of toys and necessary I, items I have to really, to really take in the recreation side of Montana. Yeah. hundred percent. And to do that in Alaska, just start involving airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> so the next big question is when do you get your pilot's license, dude? When's that happening? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's Not like, a bad thing. well, I, we, we laugh, but it's like, I wouldn't put it past you, man. Cause I, my buddy, uh, Wilson, which I, I'd love for the two of you to meet. He lives in Idaho. Um, he's, he's a Pacific Northwesterner is where he grew up. He grew up in Washington and uh, was a duck hunter and stuff like that. And he moved to Pennsylvania because he, he met his wife in Colorado. And then they, her family was in PA. And so they moved back here, had a family and so forth. And when he moved back here, he, he had duck hunted and stuff when he lived out there and he had never, you know, big game hunted or deer hunted or anything like that. And so when he moved here, he started, you know, bow hunting and stuff. And, um, and then, you know, his parents retired. And so two years ago he moved out to, um, out to, uh, out to Idaho and, you know, and loves elk hunting. You know, he's all ate up with, you know, chasing elk. And he actually went to the, uh, he went to the Frank church wilderness this year too, to hunt mule deer, um, which he had a great experience there. It's a fly in type of thing. Yep. And when he got back from that trip and I was laughing, whenever I said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you get your pilot's license, because after he did that trip, the only way you get into the church is you got to fly in. And he was sitting around talking to all these old timers by the, by the uh, landing strip. And, uh, he was kind of listening to their conversation kind of talking with them. And, he, and finally he was like, what do you do? You know, you know, they're all kind of BS. And the one guy's like, 
you see this here, this landing strip? He's like, yeah. He's like, I own it. You know, he's like, see those planes over there? He's like, I own those too, you know? And so it kind of dawned on him. He's like, man, I really want to be able to hunt all these different places. He wants to get back to Alaska to hunt. And, uh, he's like, the biggest challenge of it is he's like, is, is the travel. He's like the biggest logistical kind of challenge of it is the, is the travel. He's like, so he's like, I've always wanted my pilot's license. He's like, so why don't I just get my pilot's license and buy a plane? He's like, and I can fly to hunt wherever I want to, wherever I want to hunt. And so that's what he's right. doing. <laughs> You're exactly right. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in the aspect of, I have some phenomenal contacts. I, sh- I don't even want to call them contacts. They're the greatest of friends that you could ask right up there. But the relationship has turned into and provided me with some opportunities that, for most men would never happen in a lifetime. And I am have a standing invitation to come back. Nice. So kudos, kudos to the, those guys up there. And you're right about getting a pilot's license. Just open so many more doors. You look at a guy like a uh, up and coming guy on Instagram there, Adam Grenda mm-hmm. flying around trapping up there and shows you a whole different perspective of what, what kind of territories still out there. Yeah. And if you can, hop in your super cub and fly around it's not that easy but you build yourself a shop home in an airport hangar and you have a super cub right i mean you can you can cover a lot of cool ground <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah just need those three things right like just yeah but dude i don't know if i could do the the classwork for the pilot stuff man there was um shoot uh, i was on a hunt in virginia a couple weeks or i guess about a month ago and one of the guys that was there um, that I got to meet and talk with was a, a fellow who he's a photographer and stuff and he does uh, drone deer recovery, but he uses uh, infrared, I think, or like uh, heat sensing imagery to help recover oh. deer. And, um, and we were kind of talking about it a little bit and he was just, I don't remember how we got on the topic, but he, he, I think I had mentioned Wilson wanting to get his pilot's license, this, that, the other. And he had mentioned that basically for his drone license, like he had to know like the, the weight limits and this, that, like all the stuff you would need to know as a pilot, he had to kind of take, like, it was a very similar test, which I thought was kind of crazy. And he was just kind of spit like spouting some stuff off to me. And I was like, I don't know that I, I don't know that I could learn it. It's just, it's my brain doesn't necessarily work in that kind of mechanical way that I was like, I, I literally don't know if I could pass that test to do that, but I guess enough time, enough coffee, you know, anything's possible. Attitude and effort. That's right. That's right. So how was, uh, how was the, so you did the moose hunt and I know if I'm not mistaken, like your wife ended up killing a, uh, she ended up getting an elk this year too, right? So we did the, uh, did the moose hunt in the area we were hunting was pretty standard throughout the state of Alaska, 50 inch minimum inside spread Mm -hmm. or four brow tines or greater on either side. And her and I, talked openly that we we were we were looking for something 60 inches or bigger Mm -hmm. and man we saw a lot of bulls and when i'm talking a lot of bulls clint on my day counts tallying them up at the end of uh, a nine-day hunt over 70 bulls holy smokes man now i don't know how many we saw multiple times but say we even saw half that 35 40 bulls we, we had a day we saw 16 different bulls in one day. And a lot of that, a lot of those were 45 to 48 inches. We never put eyes on a bull that, that got us really fired up. Mm-hmm. And we never, I mean, we've never been there, mm-hmm. never seen a Yukon moose, but we set a standard and we stuck to it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that was a, that speaks a lot of my wife. That's hard to, to do, man. To put, you know, I, I put her in situations that um, inside 60 yards hmm. on bulls that were hovering around that 50 to 53 inch mark with a 300 wind mag in her hand that I've seen her shoot 400 yards pretty consistently with. And there's, you know, six, seven bulls standing there and hmm. one or two of them for sure is legal. Hmm. You know, yeah. set the standard and live it. That's so it we, we, we came back feeling very fulfilled in what we did, no grudges. I mean, success only didn't come to us as far as harvesting by choice. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a good, 
that it brings me to another question, man, is um, because I think after that, that trip, when I came out to visit on that hunt, I think that after that trip is when I really started, I started viewing a successful hunt a little bit differently than a, than a filled tag. Right. And, you know, we don't always, we don't always win. Right. Like the, the hunt is often a, uh, you know, a, a series of, you know, not missed opportunities, but things that slip through your fingers because an animal did an, did, you know, elk did elk things or deer did a deer thing or turkeys did a turkey thing or whatever the case is that you just can't account for sometimes. And so I'm curious for you, man, you know, you've been able to hunt a lot of different species and do a lot of cool hunts and have a lot of cool experiences. You know, how do you kind of qualify or how do you qualify a success for a hunt for you now? Man, that's a great question, Clint. And just a, a great question for, for people to chew on in everyday life. Yeah. How does one measure success? Mm-hmm. And that, that goes through different chapters of life and different levels of, of your hunting career. Mm-hmm. I, I reflect back when I was younger, it was just like, there was a part of me that was like, kill, kill, kill. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and, but you grow out of that. But for me that you said 2017 kind of really opened your eyes for that. And it was in 2016 for me, I drew a highly coveted elk tag in, in Montana. When I mean coveted, it was like over 12,000 applicants for around a hundred tags. Yeah. So I, remember was like, you, I remember when you drew that. Yeah, it was like a, it was under a 1% chance draw. So mm-hmm. I had this coveted golden ticket in my pocket and I start scouting and talking to everyone that I could. It was ever that I've ever known or got a phone call, drew the tag and you, you quickly learn that, hey man, just because you got this tag in your pocket and a trophy unit doesn't mean that you're going to kill a bull of a lifetime. You still got to work for it. Right. Yeah. So I, I saw. To answer that question, like looking at that scenario, going into a new unit and starting to scout in July and find an elk and find good caliber bulls, like that's success. I had a successful day. Mm -hmm. Um, Fast forwarding it to the season of archery season, man, I went into that unit that year, came to full draw with inside 30 yards, 15 yards, inside six yards on bulls bigger than I've ever killed in my life with a bow and arrow. (laughs) And I let them walk. Like, I mean, how hard is that? That, man? that? That is success. Yeah. And I can, when you have that ticket in your pocket of a unit like that, everybody you talk to, every time you talk to, Hey man, you fill your elk tag yet? What's taking you so long? What's going on in there? So you have this, not just pressure you put on yourself, but pressure from your peers for a level of some level of expectations out of you for, to produce. Yeah. And you got to just be, block that out. And now for me, Clint, I'm kind of shifting into those golden years of like, you know, the old timers would say, you come back from hunting and they'd say, well, that's why they called hunting and not killing, right? right? There's, there's a lot of truth to that. And if you're just trying to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life, you know, you got a lot grinding on your brain and you can just get to the mountains Mm -hmm. and decompress and get into a place that brings you peace. That's success. Yeah. Yeah. 100% 100% man. I couldn't agree more. Like that was that trip for me was kind of a de- the the defining moment of that was it's just cuz I was kind of struck just by like everything that 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 country had to offer. You know, it's like waking up waking up in the tent hearing elk bugling first thing in the morning. You know what I mean? I was like what a like you couldn't you couldn't pick a better better way to wake up. You know, and then driving, you know, we had like side by sides or whatever back in that area that we could run around on and we'd get to that one glassing point and just watch the the mountains wake up and glass that area. You know, it's like, to me, it, it was when I kind of, I started drinking all of that in, you know, and realizing th- this might be kind of weird, but I've told people this before, but that was the first time that trip on the drive home. And while I was, while we were in the mountains and when we would be in like a, either driving through kind of like a really remote area or we'd be, somewhere on the hunt in like a really kind of out of the way spot. And I would stop and just think and look at the landscape and just try to imagine like what critters and what people have been here before me. And I wonder what they had seen. 
are we, are we looking at the same thing? Like almost like I was able to go back in time to a degree. Right. Does that make any sense? Or is that crazy talk? That's a phenomenal perspective. Yeah. Really phenomenal perspective. It's, and I get lost in that sometimes, you know, in that kind of idea and, and, you know, wanting to deepen the experience, which is part of the reason why, you know, I'm starting to you know shoot a longbow because I want to deepen that experience. I want to, I want to feel things the way people before me had felt them. You know, and I want to see things the way people before me have seen them, you know, um, trying to get as close to that as I can. And that trip was the first time that I actually got a little taste of it. And ever since it's like, all I wanted was more of that and not necessarily just the West, but like just more of that, like deepness and richness of experience, regardless of the tag filled, just the richness of the experience. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a man. Feel blessed to look at it through that lens. Clint. Yeah. I think the world a better place if more people look through through the hunting industry if you want to call it such or your experience in the woods through that same lens yeah yeah and maybe it's getting older dude you know maybe that has something to do with it <laughs> right? right you know and yeah. i'll go ahead going back to your question you of what how do i kind of measure success now of like in the woods to cater that to elk hunting but also something you can relate to whitetail hunting like bases loaded grand slam for me now is to go out put in time behind the glass find a mature representation of of a rocky mountain elk that i want to take put several attempts on that elk and then one day harvest it with my bow yeah like to go out there with premeditated intent for a specific critter mm-hmm and to get it done and to walk past others that you could have passed, that you've passed up opportunities on and to do it on public land. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that to me is a pipe dream. Yeah. To go out and build to them, to that critter, they, they have no idea who you are, <laughs> but to me, you build some level of reputation. I mean, I don't run trail cameras out there yep. to where I pinpoint things like that. I, I burn a lot of, a lot of daylight through the spotting scope. Obviously you've hunted with me. Yeah. And, but to relate to it with, you know, you guys, whitetail hunting, you have a buck that you name, you've been hunting him for three seasons and you go to the stand 20 to 30 days a year to kill that one buck. Mm-hmm. And you might not kill deer that year cause you're holding out for that, that one. And then, then you finally put it together. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's setting that goal, right? Whatever that goal is and just, and chopping wood and carrying water, you know, yeah. that's, that's what it comes down to, you know, whatever that, whatever that goal happens to, uh, happens to be. But you'd mentioned about when you drew that, you know, that, uh, that trophy unit. And, um, and I remember, you know, talking to you whenever I came out, you know, when we were, we were talking about that hunt a little bit and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at one point you'd mentioned to me, that you were glad to have us out there that year with you because you spent so many days hunting alone with that trophy tag yeah. because you felt compelled. Like you had to be out every single day because of how rare the tag is And that. That's right. Part of it got to a point to where you were like, is it even worth it? You know, because you didn't have that camaraderie. You have a buddy couldn't necessarily go hunt with you. Right. Cause he doesn't have the tag. Right. So it was very much a, a solo, you know, and kind of a lonely mission to a degree, right? Yeah. I, uh, 54 days, that number sticks tight in my mind. Yeah. From that unit from starting in July to, uh, killing a, killing a bull in rifle season, uh, in November mm-hmm. 50. And you're right. You know, I, you gotta love the process. Yeah. You gotta love the process, but the, the camaraderie and the memories that you build with the right, with the right guys that you're rubbing elbows with in rugged country. You can't replicate that. No, it's you, you all embrace the suck together. You know what I mean? That's what it's just like, it's like wrestling growing up. Or I was actually talking about this with a guy on the mat the other night. Um, he was kind of a newer guy yesterday. He's been, I think he's been at the gym for like eight, eight weeks or uh, I'm sorry, like eight months. 
and uh i'd never rolled with him before and so he's you know we, we get we you know, i asked him i was like hey you want to get around he's like yeah we'll get around and um i asked him how you know how long he'd been training he told me and i asked him if he liked it and he said yeah you know he's like i love it and uh i just kind of smiled at him and i said yeah i was like it's it's pretty cool going you know eating shit together isn't it you know he just kind of <laughs> smiled and he's like you're damn right it is you know <laughs> like and it wasn't even like so much like oh i love grappling it was more of like i just like being around a bunch of hard people that like to do hard stuff you know what i mean it's that idea and that's always comes to mind whenever you do western hunts is that like you got to pick your hunting buddies wisely and they better like to grind too right there, there's the key component to it right there care clint they better like to grind too yeah the, the group suffering is not just by circumstances but it's by choice yep you're, you're choosing to endure that yeah. and finding yeah like it's rare <laughs> yeah it is man it is it's a. Uh, it's not for the, uh, it's not for the, uh, faint, faint of heart. That's for sure. I mean, there's plenty of ways to kind of experience the West, you know, um, for me, you know, cause my, my dad, he, he always asked me, he's like, yeah, why, why do you like to go out there and hunt, hunt public? It's, you know, make it harder, this, that, the other. And, and I just said, you know, one day I won't be able to, you know, I think it's just a mindset shift. And I, I even try to use this in like everyday life anymore. And instead of saying I have to, right? Say I get to, right? It's like, I get to go out and and hike this mountain and have my body hurt afterwards. Cause there'll come a day where I, where I I can't anymore. And so while I can, I want to drink it in. Yeah, man. You know, couldn't, just couldn't been said again right there for sure. I'm the same way. You know, there's parts of me now that are like, ah, why am I out here fighting with these guys on public land? And, uh, the frustrations of that. But my key to success has always been just outworking people. Mm -hmm. Like by simply doing things that others can do, but they choose not to. Yep. And at the same time, my good buddy, Matt, who, you know, was out there hunting with us. Yep. We don't say, you know, we'll hike to the moon to kill him or we'll shoot him in the parking lot. You right. got to go elk car and some years they're easy. Some, I mean, we have killed elk Clint where you can see the truck with a bow and arrow. <laughs> and I'm not talking driving down the road and jumping out and running over and getting, putting the quick on one. I'm talking just watching the herd timing things and then hunting your way back. And the elk have just moved into that area and you could, you could live. I'm not talking also from the top of the mountain, looking down and seeing the truck, you know, six miles away, <laughs> right? <laughs> hundreds of yards. Right. And we've also went in 17, 18 miles one way mm-hmm. and packed them things out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, the, I always say, man, like, you know, one of the things, you know, for me, especially this, you know, whole Kansas hunting experience of trying to figure out how to, spot and stock whitetails and, and, uh, you know, and, and being dead set on doing it from the ground and, and stuff is that once you, f- once you figure out how to remove your ego and kill them the way they want to be killed, makes the game a lot easier to play. Cause oh. too many times people have it set in their mind how they want to do it. And it's just like, uh, it's gotta be done this way. You know, it's like, well, if you watch what they're doing, like they'll tell you how they want to be killed. You just gotta be, you know, open enough to see it. Yeah, that, you know, when I was in high school, my buddy Matt and I, same guy I just referenced. Yeah. In the spring of the year, we would try and get turkey hunts in before 815 bell for first period. Yeah. And this is, this is the God's honest truth. One morning we made it to class on time. We worked in on seven different gobblers in the spring, Clint, and we, we busted them all Mm -hmm. by trying to by trying to be on our watch and not their watch. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot of lessons in those, those couple mornings. Yeah. By just simply me. you're on their clock. Yep. Yep. How many, uh, how many bells did you miss with Matt? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the greatest, the greatest part of it was we had a little VHS recorder right. that I would pass down in the day, you know, senior year. Yeah. We missed quite a few for sure. <laughs> Our assistant principal, you know, he'd always give us the side eye. 
but at the same time you'd be like all right what do you got on footage for me right yeah see that's the one benefit like people don't know that grew up if they didn't grow up in the country man it's like you know late late in for hunt or from hunting principal's a hunter kind of gives you that side out like he should be mad at you because but you know the reason he's really kind of mad at you is because he wasn't doing it too (laughs) right you know that was that was the beautiful part about growing up in the country goes back to where we come from to put it in perspective for people that might not have this but i still think even to this day where i went to school the opening day of buck season is like a teacher in service day or it's just a scheduled day off school yeah 100 percent. there's no <laughs> yeah exactly well the funny thing is now is like you know <clears throat> when i moved back from pennsylvania and i'd go i would go down and hunt with uh Megan's dad, you know, for, for a couple of years down to his, down to his place, you know, it's like, cause all these, you know, guys like they, you know, they were teachers and they knew your dad and your dad knows them. And, and, you know, coach Droz that coach, you know, wrestling at, you know, where I went to school and, and, uh, yep. and stuff like that. And I would, I'd be hunting with coach and all these guys, like all those dudes, you know, that, that, that were either our teachers or our coaches in, in school, like they were, they were big hunters too. You know what I mean? It's, and it's funny as you get like older and you start, hanging out with them and, and hunting with them and stuff like that. You hear some, uh, you hear some doozies of, uh, of stories that I can't really tell on this show, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's funny how all that stuff kind of comes full circle, especially in those small towns like that. And, and, and growing up in places like we, like where we grew up where hunting such a part of, of what you did. It wasn't, it wasn't just, uh, there was no Instagram. People weren't doing it for the gram. They were doing it because that was the lifestyle. That's how they were raised. Right. You know, and I'm thankful for that. You know, some people may or may not have liked where they grew up, you know, and sometimes you don't like it in the moment while you're growing up. But when you think about it, you know, in hindsight, it's like you count your blessings that you did, you know, and grow up in in an area like that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that, Clint. But uh, what's that? I feel very blessed. Yeah. Privileged to grow up from a from a good, healthy home and community of people, you know, that had our betterment in their best interest. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, speaking of the future, man, or thinking of the future, rather, uh, what's your plans for 24, man? What do you got going? What do you got cooking this year for, for hunts? Ooh, right. Um, Cause it's, man, it's, it's going to sneak up on us, man. It's just around the corner. Yes, so Alaska is obviously in the conversation, like I alluded to before. Yeah. What species uh-huh. back for, back for moose? Yeah, back yeah. for moose is what, whether it's going to happen or not, we're going to see. But um, elk and deer in Montana mm-hmm. for uh, September. Um, and we're blessed in Montana. I mean, we got five weeks of archery season, five weeks of rifle season for general units. So you get a lot of hunting. You get a lot of hunting in, out there. Yeah. Um, Any speed goat for you? <laughs> You know, I, I put in for it. Mm-hmm. I killed a really good speed goat a handful of years ago, and I I love eating antelope. Mm-hmm. I love them. One of my favorite favorite meats to eat, to be honest. But, um, yeah, if I draw a tag, for sure, that'll be a thing. Nice. But that's just kind of by the luck of the draw. But Montana, and then we got points going in uh, Colorado, Wyoming, did a point in Arizona. I don't know. I'm sitting at like, I think we got six or seven deer points in Wyoming and Colorado right now. So it's kind of getting that down to that decision of when, when to put those forth and, and plan a trip. Right. Yeah. Cause isn't Colorado like four, you can get a pretty good unit. Eight, you can get a, a slammer unit. Is that what it is? Roughly. That's what they say. Yeah. Uh, so that time is coming now. Matt and I, and I think Buddy, mm-hmm. he has uh, he has some points in there with us. So we're looking to the main target down there would be mule deer. Yeah, especially. Yeah, Matt's all ate up with the mule deer right now. The last time I talked to him, he, that's all that fool wants to talk wants to think about. Right? They give you they get in the bug. I think they're the, I think they're the, the coveted golden goose egg of public land western hunt really like a really trophy mule deer in the the mountains not i'm talking a mountain mule deer 
right not a not a plains deer but a, a high mountain mule deer buck for sure that's hmm. for me personally yeah i'm still i don't know i'm still just focused on elk like i just want to kill elk that's what i want to do maybe I, after i finally get one of those under my wings maybe then i'll be more interested in in mule in mule deer i think my Colorado trip, I think, will be in two or three years. I should have because I'm just I'm focusing on units that I can draw with four points, and so I should be there here in like the next year, two years, maybe. I think I know. Well, actually, I, I would be able to get next year, but I think I'm going to go back to Idaho one more time before I call it quits on Idaho and then start start branching out. Right. Another great state. Idaho has a lot to offer for the over the counter non resident. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been hunting in that Coeur d'Alene area. It's just, it's just a whole different, a whole different animal, like just dark timber and steep, man, rugged. Uh, I fought a fire up in there out of Lake. Uh, they have a big lake up there out between kind of Coeur d'Alene and, uh, Sandpoint, Idaho. There it's called uh, Lake Penderay. Mm-hmm. Roughly like 1200 feet deep. They got the naval, the Navy has a uh, submarine testing facility up there. Oh, but wow. Some of the most mountains I've ever worked in, just steep, steep, dirty. Mm-hmm. Just want to cuss at them, steep mountains up there, man. And to, to think about hunting elk in there would really humble a guy. Oh man. It was, it was a teeth kicking. That was for sure. It was, uh, I mean, the crazy thing was, is we were on elk most every day, like to where you couldn't really ever see them. Like I would be set up in an area. We walked this old logging road and we'd found a couple big wallows and we set up and you know how like you get into an area and like they've been there frequently enough or re- recently enough that you can just kind of, you can smell them, you know, get to a spot and it's like, we all kind of stop and we're like, man, it smells like elk here. And so we're like, let's just set up here and just sit, do a little calling, maybe see what, see what we might be able to strike up. And as dark's kind of getting on us, you just start to hear like the footsteps behind us and look they weren't more than 30, 40 yards behind us. And I couldn't see them. Like you could hear them. And there was more than, there was more than one. There were several, but you just couldn't see them. Right. You know, we had one real good encounter on like day two. We had our herd basically walk into within, I don't know, three yards was the closest one. It was on the other side of the Aspen tree from me. <laughs> I could have reached out and pet it. You know, it was a cow. I didn't have a cow tag, so I couldn't do anything with that. And, uh, she blew and, and, uh, we're not blue, but she just kind of stomped and took off. And like the whole herd just came ripping by us. And it was like probably like 15 elk just blazing by us at warp speed. But that was the best encounter that we had on the, on the trip. But I'm kind of like, you know, (laughs) like you it's like i like the tough hunts and that's one of those places where it's like i, I want to go back can until i finally fill a tag in that area because it's so hard to do right you know so we're kind of reflecting back to that question we alluded to earlier what was the goal of that hunt was it just a legal bull elk or did you guys have some type of standard set that was it for me it was going to be any legal bull elk i was going to kill beautiful yeah it was, I wasn't going to be just knowing how tough it was. And there wasn't really any glassing opportunities, you know, where we were at, um, you know, and, uh, yeah. And I was like, for a first elk, it's like, I'm not gonna be choosy, man. I'm going to shoot the first legal bull I see. I yeah. love that, man. Yeah. It's, that's, if you, if you've never done it to understand the complexity of when it all comes together is nothing else in my life. Granted, I've, I haven't had children or experienced birth personally, right? Right. The overwhelming feeling of when all that comes together. There's there's nothing else in my life that compares minutely to that yeah. level of just accomplishment. Yeah. I would agree, man. That and I'm kind of like, you know, that hunt experience with you on that day in that in that one area that had a we had a bull screaming at us at like 25 yards, you know, like that's, that sticks in my mind, you know what I mean? Like that was, that was intense. And so that's kind of like the, the drug that I'm chasing every time I kind of go back out West is that, you know, it's like, I want that type of experience when I, when I let an arrow go, you know? Um, but 
also kind of setting the ego aside, knowing that, you know, that type of experience doesn't always necessarily come by. Like, you know, so maybe I should just, you know, humble myself and, you know, shoot a, a legal animal, you know, and, and build from there, you know? And so that's kind of what I chose to do because when I first was thinking about it, I was like, that was the, that was what I was kind of measuring everything to. But that, that experience that day was just incredible, you know, and uh, probably would have been doing myself a disservice if I kind of compared everything, you know, on the most recent trip to, to that particular experience. Oh yeah. I mean, I reflect a lot back onto that trip when, you know, every hunt that I, that I harvest in, I try and reflect back to why, why did it come together that day? And why didn't it, why didn't it come together the 99 other times? Right. To shed a little light on that for your listeners. <clears throat> Like I said, we did we did over 70 miles hiked. And I want to say, what was it, six, maybe eight days? Yeah, yeah. We were averaging around 10 a clip to 12 a clip a day. And we went from being in an area with target-rich environment, a lot of elk, but we're tight-lipped, to shifting to a different place to hunt where Clint spoke of where we hiked in with uh, all that wet snow. A lot of miles went in there. <clears throat> we get back in there and we get into elk. We get it. We see bulls totally unresponsive to calling. Mm -hmm. I'm talking, we were seeing three, four bulls bachelored up together. Like it was early August. Yeah. We're, we're prime 22nd, 23rd of September. To then that night we go in there and our buddies went in on the same mountain within a couple hundred yards of us at a little different elevation below us. No action for them. And we hit the hot pocket of the Dude, bull that it, it just wanted to go. It was popping off. It was it was incredible. I mean, what we heard a couple bulls bugling that night, and they were down over this steep bank. Mm -hmm. I did some calling to them, and I was like, man, I don't, I don't really feel like walking down in there after them. <laughs> they started coming, one started coming towards us. Yep. And, you know, I saying that I reflect on that in that moment, I was really like relaxed and saying, oh, we're not going to put the pressure on that because one, I don't want to walk down there. And two, I don't think he's that fired up. It's worth us walking down there. And it was like the last night or two for you guys to be there. I was yeah. thinking, oh, we come back in the morning and it'll be on. And then we make some move forward on that elk. I call. I had to go to the bathroom. So I bumped back total silence for the 10 to 15 minutes of digging a cat hole come back to it and that elk could cut us two thirds closer. Mm -hmm. And I was just getting ready to put you in position and you go, don't move. There he is. I remember. <laughs> and that was the and first I thought, time I'd seen an elk no that way. close. I thought, no way he's seeing shit. And I leaned around that tree and there he was just walking towards us. And I mean, like you said, 25 yards, that bull came in. We both knocked an arrow we were standing shoulder to shoulder. I know. It's crazy. And I, when I stopped that bull in that opening, my, I, I've told you this before, but my full intention was for you to take the shot. Yeah. Yeah. Both full draw and I cow called and that bull threw the brakes on. And I've seen it enough that when you, when you put the brakes on one inside, even say 80 yards, 60 yards, you're probably not going to get another look at him. Right. Right. The the game's either up or they're really hot and they're coming faster. Right. And I didn't have a shot with the way that tree was that was that we had in between us. I had a branch that was in front of me that I couldn't I couldn't do anything with where he was at. I stopped that bull with a cow call and he bugled. Dude, that bugled thing felt right like someone shot like a freaking <laughs> like a, a like an X ray or like a laser beam through my chest. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And we were both there and I know I had the, my pin was on the vital. Like right now while I'm on, on the call with you, I'm, I'm at full draw, just walking through this in my mind. Like I had that 20 pin on the vital and I didn't know if it was 20 or 30 and I just held 30 pin a little low and I'm thinking, God, Clint squeeze off, God, Clint squeeze off. And I just punched it. <laughs> you know, we had success. Yep. How do you measure success? Right. I mean, that, yeah. That, that whole, that whole thing, <laughs> the way it played out was just, was crazy, man. The, uh, my favorite part of that though, when I tell people that, you know, recount that, uh, that trip or that part of the trip 
is that it, if you remember, we were leaving the truck and we were kind of getting stuff ready because we parked, you know, like in this area, it was at the bottom of the mountain before we kind of walked up and over. And I was getting my stuff ready, putting, you know, throwing some water in my pack and whatever. And you're like, come on, Campbell, let's go. It's no pack Sunday. It was on a, uh, it was on a Sunday. I think it's no pack Sunday. I'm like, what are you talking about? And you're like, we're not taking a pack today. You're like, we don't take a pack. We'll kill today. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Westerner, man. I, I need to take some water. Like you slammed like a bottle of water and we were gone and you were like, no pack Sunday. And when we killed that thing and we're bringing, we, we brought out a, a front shoulder and a quarter because we lost light and there's that snow on the ground right after, after that yep. snow. And you were like, give me the pack. I'll take the hind quarter cause it's heaviest. Right. And I'll, you know, and you were like, you just, you grab a front shoulder. So I threw a front shoulder on my head or on my shoulder and we're getting ready to walk out. And, uh, I'm like, got my headlamp on and I'm like, where's your headlamp? And you were like, well, I didn't bring one. It's in my pack. I'm like, all right, well, no pack Sunday. We don't have a, I have an extra, I don't have a headlamp. All right. I'll, I'll go in front. So I start walking to walk us out and my freaking headlamp dies. Like, <laughs> And we ended up having to walk all the way back to the truck in the snow up that side of the mountain, down the other side. And it was all scree partway down the other side to the truck. Like, I just remember like thinking to myself, I'm like, Shimer, man, you get me killed out here with no headlamp because you want to bring a freaking backpack. Like if I, if, if the mountain doesn't kill us, <laughs> I might kill you when we get back. <laughs> you know, but that's why it's memorable, Clint. That's right. It's that type two fun, buddy. You don't remember the, the sunny, bright days. No. You remember the during times. And now where I do most of my hunting in Montana to, to add another level of uh, danger to it, it's just overrun with grizzly bears. Oh, dude, so like, you sent me some, some videos of you hunting with like grizzly bears rolling by. And I'm like, dude, I don't know how you let that thing get that close to you. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's but, one of the things that I find key in my success to Western hunting is putting in, putting in miles under your headlamp. You know, some guys have the attitude of, oh, why walk in the dark? You're going to walk past animals. Well, if I know where critters are and I need to be at a certain glassing point, I'm putting miles on before the sun comes up and staying there until dark. You know, you don't see a lot of stuff until that last, they say half an hour, but even the 15 to 10 minutes is when things really get on their feet for the evening and Mm -hmm. you got to, you got to be there for it. And yeah. Yeah seeing grizzly bears feeling them hearing them in the mountains bluff charge it's a whole different level of it now out there man oh. where we were at no grizzly bear here yeah yeah i was i was very excited about that <laughs> <laughs> that's the one thing like that area in uh in idaho there are some grizz in that in that area um, not nearly what you have to deal with man but how uh how many grizzly bears do you see like how many do you how many do you see in a season usually some seasons I go and I don't see any. Really? I, I'm around sign of them all the time. You can smell them. You're right in there with them. You know, more often than not, they, they have a nose on them that's phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal. And they they know you're in the country long before you ever even decided to get out of the truck, right? Right. The issue is when you surprise them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're sleeping or the, you're, a lot of times you're we're hunting into the wind, mm-hmm. right? things in front of you this year i did see a couple there's some areas that we hunt right around my our house that's a heavy travel corridor for grizzly bears in montana and it's a it's the connectivity route between the the population kind of in up near glacier Mm -hmm. and the greater yellowstone population they Mm -hmm. run that continental divide and we spend a lot of time hunting it um Hmm. you can't even walk out of your house at night without being weary like there might be a bear around that's that's the cold hard truth of it right so you just you just pray that nothing bad happens and you keep going about life and you you pack the appropriate stuff bear spray i always have on me Mm -hmm. um i pack a glock 10 millimeter loaded with uh 180 grain maybe i even got 200s in there Mm -hmm. pray to god i never have to use the thing right yeah do you think do you think the population is getting to a point to where they should consider having a season? Whew. That's a really complex question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> are my, are my thoughts there? Yes. <clears throat> Being that I worked, you know, close to 15 years with the federal land management agency that we dealt 
directly with day-to-day stuff around the grizzly bear direction. And a lot of our actions were kind of towards getting the grizzly bear delisted. Mm -hmm. Our practices. They set, they set an objective goal, the federal and the state, and they've surpassed that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there were things in place to, all right, say we want now 20 breeding pairs of grizzly bears in the state of Montana. And now we're looking at twice that. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? Right. I think, yeah, it's, it's time to, uh, time to put in a managed way to harvest them. And I think what you're going to see out of that personally is not just the bears that you're able to harvest annually, but maybe the ability to start putting things in a pecking order. If you look at a place like Alaska, where you don't have the near the grizzly bear conflicts that you have in the lower 48, Mm -hmm. because they know their place in the pecking order, right? Mm -hmm. They see him and they they associate fear in their mind. Montana's put some things into place for livestock depredation. Um, Ranchers are able to, you know, work with the state, either trap or put down bears that have become problematic. But pretty much in the West, man, if, if, if they're invading your personal property and destruction of that, you have no no jurisdiction on the matter. It's not until your life is threatened right. that you can kind of, so it's, a, it's, is there a black and white answer to it? Maybe, but are we operating in the gray? Yes. Right. Yeah. That's a good way to, that's a good way to put it. And I mean, last year, just, you know, from afar, you know, watching, you know, <clears throat> reports coming out of the West and, you know, just the news coming out of the West, I feel like I saw way more, grizzly bear encounters and encounters that ended badly more so last year than I had in years previously. Like, am I, is that correct or is, or if I just, or did I just see more of it last year? Cause I felt like there was a lot more like bad grizzly encounters that occurred last year than years previously. You know, it's not uncommon that these grizzly bear conflicts just don't get a media light shined on them for that's flawed by design. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hear no evil, see no evil type of thing. So uh, it's a double edged sword mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there, it, it, there's definitely an uptick on the on the conflict with it. A lot of it just day to day. People out recreating, walking their dog, fishing the river. Mm-hmm. things like that. These bears are starting to now move back into their uh, traditional home habitat. They were a plains animal. So you're seeing them shift more into central, even in towards kind of Eastern Montana. Well, I even just heard, where did I read it? I think I saw, read somewhere that they had seen one now as far East as Colorado. I want to say, does that sound right? Maybe. I don't, I don't know. And it was, and it was, and I, I, I think it was Colorado and I, I might be wrong on that, but I remember whenever I saw where, where they had, where someone had seen it and it was a, it was a, it was a, cor- a cor- uh, how do you say it? corroborated account or whatever, or that someone who, the person who said they saw it, like it was, uh, confirmed that they had seen what they suggested they had seen. Um, and I remember whenever I had, had read it, whatever state it was in, and it was in a place where they aren't typically, you know, known to, to, to live essentially it's outside of like their, their home range. And I remember when I had seen that and I was like, well, I was like, it was just a matter of time, you know, cause they lived all over the West. Like at, at one point, it wasn't like they only lived in that little area in which they live in now or that people, you know, and during modern times kind of know to be grizzly country, like grizzly country used to, you know, spread across the West, not just that little pocket. Right. I think it's great that we have, them. yeah, I think that there's a, there's a wildness to it that I really connect with Clint, that I love that they're out there that, that lets you know, yeah. that, you know, it feel alive. Yeah. But at the same time, I think there's also, we need a balance Yeah. and how do we get, how do we get to that balance? You know, 
that was, that's what really needs to be figured out. Yeah. 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 And I like that they're there too, man. I like, I like all critters being around, um, you know, being able to experience them. I've always said, it's like, I would like to see one grizzly in my life from a, from a fair distance in my spotting scope. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, I'll be fulfilled then. I won't need to see one ever again after that. <laughs> I just like to know that they're there, but <laughs> Sweet, man. Well, hey, buddy, I've kept you on here for like an hour and 15 minutes. I want to be sensitive to your time. I know you're an hour ahead of me um, where you're at. Um, I appreciate you coming on. We got to do this more often. Uh, it was good to see you when we were trying to do video. It's good to hear your voice. Um, I look forward to trying to get back out west. Is, when I when I do make it to Montana, I'll certainly let you know. Uh, but before I let you go, uh, if you wouldn't mind, let people know, you know, if they want to follow along with you, you know, where they can find out more what you got going on, you know, on Instagram and so forth. Yeah, so personal Instagram account is just my full name, Luke Shimer, S H I M E R. And I think there might be an underscore in it. Um, you can follow along with my wife and I have going on with uh, Drink St. John. She owns a phenomenal little bar down here, right in the heart of the Caribbean and Cruise Bay on St. John. So if you ever make it down this way, look us up. It's The bar's name is Drink. And that's the best. You know, if anybody has has a need or a, a want or some more personal information, feel free to reach out to me directly and no qualms. Awesome, buddy. Well, Hey man, I appreciate you, dude. And, uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. And, uh, I know you'd mentioned, uh, when we were talking off air that you're, you're going to be heading back this way for some, some wrestling events. And I'll see if, uh, if I, if I can't make it to the wrestling event, maybe we can at least hook up while you're here. Yeah, I'd really enjoy that, Clint. Thanks again for having me on, and uh, as always, take care. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening, and if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast, and hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there, too. And before I shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout-out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Osseo Gear, Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Genesee Beer. And until next time, we'll see y'all.